Oh, All right, well, we are very excited today to welcome my herb teacher, Seven Song, to the Plant Cunning Podcast. Hi, Seven Song. Hello, AC, and hello, Isaac. Hello. How are you doing today? Um, <clears throat> somewhere in the middle, like normal. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, yeah here too. We're, we're right there with you, yeah. <laughs> So we actually had inter uh, interviewed Seven Song pretty early on um, in the history of the show. It was way back at episode six. Uh, so if folks want to hear more about Seven Song and um, his background, please go back and check out episode six. But to briefly um, introduce Seven Song, he's a clinical herbalist and a botanist and teacher mentor to lots of herbalists over the years. You've had, what, thousands of students now, Seven Song? I haven't counted. <laughs> Many. <laughs> Many. <laughs> yeah, between- At least your, hundreds. At least hundreds, but between your programs, you have the weekend program and the full program, and then all the workshops you've given and plant walks you've given, you know, you've influenced the United States herbal scene quite a bit, so. Yeah, that's um, true. Yeah, and you're also, really um experience with herbal first aid so that's kind of going to be the focus of our chat today and i think we'll <clears throat> have you back again to go into more detail on it because there it could be hours you know um and yeah so we're gonna do it like an overview of some of the the first aid um experiences that you've had and how you know you use herbs um to treat people so um I guess the first question is, how do you distinguish first aid from your clinical practice? And, um, you know, what's, what is your scope of, and, and how do you define first aid? So my definition of first aid, I don't know if there's really a, a specific medical definition, but my definition would have to do with immediacy. So with chronic healthcare problems, um, your goal is to help the symptoms. You always want to help the symptoms, but also you're looking at the long picture. Uh, often in first aid, you're not looking at the long picture. If somebody has, if somebody has rectal bleeding from ulcerative colitis and I'm at a first aid station, um, my goal is definitely to help stop that bleeding if that's possible. I mean, that could be a very serious event. Um, so if, I can recommend that, you know, I, I could recommend or suggest that person maybe, you know, going for further treatment, different kinds of treatments, but I would say basically immediacy is really what defines uh, first aid and not so much long-term uh, health care. We have time, of course, the first aid stations, uh, and then we will talk to people about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I also have a question about that too, as far as scope of practice. Um, you know, there's always a kind of a gray area for herbalists in the U.S. Uh, because, you know, in previous generations, herbalists have gotten thrown in jail uh, for practicing herbalism. But currently, that's not really an issue. Um, but I was wondering for you and for us, like we're not healthcare professionals. We don't uh, treat or diagnose anything. We're not recommending anybody do that. But for you, what what is legal as far as first aid and treating people? So almost everybody practices medicine without a license, right? So, right. so there's the law, right? The law is practicing medicine without a license. The reality is if you're a parent and you give your child aspirin, you know, in some weird way, you are not in some straightforward way, you are practicing medicine without a license, but of course, that that's not going to be brought to court. And then, yeah. so but then we're, we're notches above that, right? Because I'm, I'm treating people that I've never met before. Mm -hmm. So in general, the, and also we're not covered by good Samaritan laws. So every state has different good Samaritan laws, but a good Samaritan law basically is meant to cover a medical professional who comes into an environment where they help out where they where they're not licensed to. So you're an EMT and somebody is on the street and you somebody passed out in a car. So you come to a car accident and you help out in the car accident and the person gets worse. They shouldn't be able to sue you, even though you're a medical professional. So Samaritan laws, every state is different, but really they're not meant, they're meant for medical professionals, not for lay people. Right. Okay. And then there's the next part of uh yeah, what I'm doing. So, you know, I mean, I work in a free clinic. So at the first aid station that I work at, there's not a lot of surveying going around about who's licensed and who's not. But working at a free clinic, that's a, you know, a brick building that people go to, there's more concern. Yeah. Um, it is, it's so I am not licensed to practice any kind of medicine, which in a sense sets it easier for me. So I cannot 
I cannot practice out of my scope because I don't have a scope. <laughs> yeah. So, but that, yeah. and that's true. Like, so if somebody was mad and wanted to bring me to court, they can, but they can't. Put, they can't get me to court for practicing without uh, out of my scope of practice. What they can do is just as one human being can do to another, is bring up for civil charges. So, most even previously, usually most um, herbalists were not brought to court. So someone like John Christopher. Who went to jail in the, I think the 1950s? He was very out there in his, you know, writing books, giving speeches, selling medicines. So I think, but I mean, a lot of I mean, I do the same thing now, right? I think though, when he did it, he was a very small subset of people that their eyes were focused on. Of course, culturally, people have been practicing herbal medicine the whole time, right? I mean, you go into any pocket, and there's people practicing. And so we're talking more like, kind of like I don't know, you go like middle class or. The, uh, more uh, colonization medicine. That seems like a pretty strong term, as opposed to the cultural pockets that have always practiced. Right. Um, so where different things have happened that are more atrocious in those circles. Um, so there's a very roundabout answer. And, and I think that it's just, it's unclear what to do with herbalists. And the way that the, federal government has tried to deal with it is through regulating uh, the products, not the practitioners, right? So you have like GMP, good manufacturing processes in place. Um, so that's the avenue that seemed to, so more FDA versus, I'm not really sure who would come after herbalists has been uh, the avenue that has put pressure on people for practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you know, with our, with herb school, you, during herb school, we all um, get a lot of experience with doing herbal first aid at the rainbow gatherings, which is a big outdoor gathering of thousands of people in the woods with, um, you know, not any electricity or anything like that. And we set up a little first aid station there um, and there's different practitioners um, and then we get to practice some of the skills that we've been learning with you throughout the program at these gatherings. So I'm wondering how you first came into working first aid at the Rainbow Gatherings. Like, how did that begin, Seven Song? I came in through the hippie door. So <laughs> <laughs> I opened that hippie door in the early 1980s. Um, I was, so basically, I mean, to keep it really short, I was hitchhiking around the country because that's what people did in the early 80s. And I met some people who told me about the Rainbow Gathering. It was really hard to find where it would be, right? Because of course, in the early 80s, this did not exist, right? There was no computer. So you have to find like somebody who knew somebody or find a poster somewhere. That right. was yeah. uh, so I found out where it was, which was us, Washington, Eastern Washington. And I hitchhiked uh, from uh, New York uh, to there. Uh, and so the first couple of years, I just went and Worked work in kitchens or, or didn't do much of anything or went to trade circles. Uh, but that became very uh, unfulfilling. So I've already started practicing. So my first herb school was in 1981, and, my, and then more formal practice in 1983, or more formal training, I mean, formal in a very, very informal way <laughs> in at the California School of Herbal Studies. So I'm starting to learn. Hmm. And so I think it was 19, yeah, I'm not sure what year it was, that I just, I just started going to the first aid station and trying to help out. They were kind of a tight-knit crew and were not really interested in me working there. Hmm. So it took a while for me to break in and do it, uh, start working there more regularly. Um, but that's how I, I just started doing, so I just started going to, go to the first aid station. Uh, the thing I started doing is I started organizing everything. So if you're an organized, it's a, it gets really chaotic there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so we're outdoors. There's no electricity. There's no, you know, it's hand washing by some kind of homemade pump if there's water available right there. Mm -hmm. And so by organizing, I stayed there and then people would, start, you know, they'd see me and start talking to me. And mm -hmm. so I'd start learning from them and some from, from some of the practitioners who were more open. Uh, to a young rapscallion trying to learn. Yeah. And can you describe um, a little bit more in detail what the first aid station looks like at the Rainbow Gatherings and what kind of equipment you have? So having done it for, I think, 30 years now, 
uh, maybe 25 years. Uh, it really varies. So every year it could be pretty variable depending. The last seven or eight years, we've had way more equipment and we've also had more, uh, we've had more professional medical people, licensed medical people, EMT, paramedics, doctors, nurses, sometimes, I mean, it really varies. And so there are, you know, in the early times, it was basically me, some herbs, and you were very normal first aid. So one thing to say about herbal first aid, it is just first aid with herbs, right? <laughs> you know, everything that you use in normal first aid, I mean, we have bandages and vent wrap and iodine and, you know, scissors, I don't know, just like the whole melange of uh, first aid equipment is exactly what we use too. I mean, you don't, I'm not going to wrap somebody's womb in plantain leaves because it's going to fall off in 10 minutes. I mean, that's yeah. cool, but I really like the look of it, but they don't stay on. And so tape is you know, expensive. So uh, what was the question again? <laughs> Just like what this first aid system looks like if somebody walks sure. in, what, what are they walking into? So it, it kind of looks the same every year. So as far as like what it looks like, it looks like tarps strung up on trees. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully the tarps are strung up well. We usually have at least one big tarp or two tarps that have done really well so water won't leak in because it inevitably rains wherever we are. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, we, so I, I have photos I can show some of uh, for yeah, folks. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so let, let me just, let me get on to, um, let me get the screen. Yeah, so the photos are not in a great order, so I'm just going to run through them. Yeah, sounds good. About what each one is, and uh, hopefully it's here. All right. All right, folks. Uh, so here are some photos from the Rainbow Gathering. Um, I got, this is a couple of years ago, this one that you're looking at now. Uh, the, white, the white and red cross flag has disappeared this year somewhere. Um, but this is pretty typical. So as I said, it's really just tarps um, and then a couple of small tents around us where we keep supplies. And then I'll show you some of the supplies. Um, so you have to, this is kind of shot. All right, so this is from this year's Rainbow Gathering. Uh, this year was in Colorado. On your, on your upper left, like close, close uh, front left, you can see a whiteboard against the table. That table is the first aid, is the self-help first aid station. So we might have sunscreen on there, band-aids, some vitamins, maybe condoms, toothbrushes, uh, things that people just come and take. And then usually I change the whiteboard uh, every day or two, just put up um, new information. Behind that, there is a brown and silver tarp. Uh, the brown and silver tarp, that's our main treating area. I'm gonna show a close up, a better close up of that in a little bit. Um, all the way to the right, there is a blue tarp, and that was our kitchen area, which we don't always have. So this year we had a tent in the behind right. So that's, uh, this, but really, this is pretty typical. Actually, this is a little bit more expanded than some years, having like a separate kitchen area, et cetera. So here's what I'm saying. This is super basic, right? There's no electricity here. You know, we do have some, we do get water. We have a water station, which didn't work. The water station, you can see, it, you can barely see it. It's the buckets in the back right corner. Um, so unfortunately, the water station didn't work as well as some years. Uh, water station, because we, we need to, we need filtered water for drinking, for making teas for people. We also need water to make foot soaks and to wash wounds. So we have good water. There are many things. So I'll try to keep it simpler. This is our new banner. We, we changed the name of the first aid station. Lots of politics at rainbow gatherings, like everywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of changed the focus of the uh, first aid station here. And so we could call it everybody's medical, meaning just what it says. Nice. Um, what else we got here? So this is the supply tent. This is when it is super organized. Uh, rarely is it ever look like this. Normally there's stuff prune, 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 mm -hmm. uh, all around. Uh, these are our intake sheets. Uh, I started implementing this, uh, I don't know, about five or six years ago. And so I know what medicines to bring in following years. Uh, so before I came on this podcast, I went to see how many people we treated this year, which was about 500 documented people. Uh, meaning each you know, about 500 of these white slips over there on the clipboards. Right to the right of that, uh, that's our filing system for keeping the slips so we can put them in order and then we can pull them out if we need somebody to come back. That's awesome. 
Uh, this is the first aid station. Don't be a vector. <laughs> there's always something. I, I write new stuff every day, uh, basically. Um, usually with a bunch of swear words in there if you look carefully, but I'll move out of that. Um, uh, this, so this is the inside of the treatment area for this year. So there's some chairs, there's a cot on the left. Um, behind us is actually where we treated people with COVID, which we'll get to. Uh, and then this is the close up. So this I put together maybe three years ago and it's been fantastic. So basically it's just been a really good way to organize like, and other stuff in between medical supplies, keeping the clipboards. And really also just bring the table, right? Rather than having makeshift planks between trees, I just started bringing more equipment and just that table alone that everything's on makes everything you see my name on it on the bottom right. Yeah. Uh, makes everything so much easier. Tables are underrated. Tables are amazing at these things. Yeah. I yeah. Think they're underrated. So anyway, you can see like on the upper left hand corner of this, that's all the tinctures and medicines. Um, and then bandages and then you know white tape and they knew where everything is. Look what else we got here. Um, this is a, a, one of the, this is called the main circle. This is where people eat at the Rainbow Gathering. Um, I'm not sure what year this is from, but that, it's pretty typical of what it looks like, frankly. People facing in and out. Anyway, it's not about feeding people at the Rainbow Gathering, which is an ordeal, but not my ordeal. ordeal. That's my van, that black van. And one thing to consider uh, doing this is like, it is packed, there's actually a tiny space that I can, I have a bed in the back that I can sleep in between like all the luggage where I can just like kind of narrowly put my body in there because I'm traveling cross country to go there. Um, but one thing is this transportation like that, my, uh, that upper, upper rack there that is packed with stuff. So I just wanted to point out that like traveling with the gear takes, it takes a lot of gear, including tables. And the last one, these are what we call our shitters. <laughs> so this is the thing I think most of my students like the, um, so basically this is a typical, I didn't draw this and fill it in for you. This is typically where people poop at the rainbow gathering. You see it's wide open to other people. Um, some of them are more narrow. Sometimes there's a few next to each other, but when you have thousands of people, you have thousands of pounds of poop. I've never weighed it. I'm just assuming that's what it is. Um, and so I just wanted to put this picture in there because it's, it's, it's a part of it, you know, like where, where are you going to put all this poop from all these people? And that's where we put it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, yeah. Cool. yeah, I loved all those visuals. Yeah, I have, I have, yeah. It's been a while since I've been to a rainbow gathering and it's bringing back a lot of memories. Especially the shitter. <laughs> yeah, and uh, of that one guy coming back saying he just got a foot long tapeworm out of his Oh no! I was but yeah, yeah. I've never seen I've never seen a tapeworm cut out of somebody's anus at the gathering. So I want to just I don't want to go into a whole rainbow gathering thing because yeah, I have a lot right, of feelings right. about them and they're very mixed. But that's what I want to say is they're very mixed. There are parts I like about the rainbow gathering. Well, what I really like about the rainbow gathering is I like doing first aid for lots of people for free and working with other people and learning and learning you know learning from patients, people coming in and learning from other practitioners. Uh, it's so the reason I am skilled in first aid, whatever amount of skill I have, is largely due uh, to 25 years of working at the Rainbow Gathering. It's only one week a year, but it's such intimidative conditions. Yeah. And like some years we'll see seven or 800 people in a week, maybe a week and a half. And a lot of them are easy. A lot of them are just, we'll talk about like what we see. Yeah. But a lot of times it's more complicated and I, and I just continually learn. And also, it's a place to give see how herbal medicine works in these situations. So, yeah, and yeah. you can um, you can apply like you know setting up a first aid station like that, you know, to other places at other festivals or as like a street medic for protests or um, you know camping. Like you can have a, a mini kit if you know you have a group of people going camping, but you can you know apply that to various things, not just the rainbow gathering. Yeah. It's true. What often when I talk about first aid, though, I'm like, well, you'll need a stretcher, you know, and more like, well, just going to a picnic, right? You don't need a stretcher. <laughs> so I often have to tone it down. It's like, well, if somebody falls out of a tree and they're like, seven song, it's in the desert. There's no trees, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but right, I, a lot of it is applicable. And also, you just like, it's confidence building, right? So you put on, 
you treat like 50, 100 staff wounds, and you start to see there's a time and a place where herbal medicine helps staff. There's a time and a place where it helps people who might be having mental health difficulties, right? In these situations. Yeah. Um, and many other things, and lots and lots and lots of foot care, which is really what we do the most. Foot care. Yeah. Foot care. Yeah. So this brings up a question that I wanted to ask you about um, sort of the scope of practice again. Like, how do you know when something is outside of your scope? If you come onto a scene um, and somebody's, you know, in distress, like what what are the things that you know you're not going to deal with, and you're just going to ask to have the person brought to a hospital? Well, it's really so. There's a lot of red flags, right? I mean, if if it seems like it might be cardiac induced, like if they seem like if they're having chest pain, uh, so people do die at rainbow gatherings, right? And probably in the same number as they die anywhere. You have seven thousand people gathered in the woods, and some there's a chance somebody will die. And frankly, it's often has to do with somebody who's on multiple medications and it might be heart disease might kick in mm -hmm. um, as opposed to wilderness accidents, which often we get somebody to a hospital. It's a hard question to answer. You know, the first thing is often people just want to go to hospital. So this is not what you're asking. But I see somebody and they're like, oh, you know, are you a doctor? I'm like, I'm not, but here's because we work with doctors. Do you want to see a doctor? I'm like, I want to go to a hospital. I'm like, you can go to a hospital, right? That's, that is your right but we're not gonna drive you to a hospital. Right? We don't have an ambulance set up. So that's gonna be the problem in that situation. Um, I think a lot of it is just, well, so having worked there a long time, my evaluation skills have gone, grown pretty good. So for instance, I can tell a staph wound that I have probably have a pretty good chance of treating from a staph wound that might be spreading and creating more and more complications, meaning more and more sores on their body that will take longer and longer to heal. Um, or, or the placement of those sores. Um, there are definitely times where I need medical help. Like if somebody comes in, let's say they were hitting a, they were hitting the head with a branch. So some, they're walking at night. Somebody moves a tree branch. The next person behind them hits him in the head, and now their vision is not great. Like I feel very out of my league with anything about that kind of neurological problems. Mm -hmm. And so then I would suggest that they uh, see a, you know, go to a hospital or see a doctor. You know, see what we can do to help them. Um, as I mentioned before, like if somebody's having a lot of blood coming out of their rectum because they have ulcerative colitis, then they even have they may, they might need blood, right? That we don't we certainly don't have IVs. Uh, we don't do blood transfusions. <laughs> no, no gathering. No, we don't do any IVs, by the way. Um, it would, but there are people there. The problem is sanitation, and yeah, uh, for I would never do it because I'm not trained. So. It's a, so there are like, we know some red flags, like what chest pain might be, or certain kinds of headaches might indicate, or levels of pain might indicate a bigger problem. But more, it's a matter of having eyes on enough situations where you start to realize it, and also having the humility to say, this is out of my league when it is. Yeah. Of course, that changes over time. I'm not really sure if it changes. I think in the beginning, in some ways, I was more cavalier than I am now. Right in the beginning, I knew less, and so maybe thought I can treat more. And now, you know, 25 yeah. years later, it doesn't speak well of me, but it speaks truthfully of me. And now I feel I have much better skills at it because also I work in a clinic with doctors. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so you gain experience and intuition, and you can tell, yeah, by by your experience. <laughs> And then I could bring other people in. Like this year, one of the students is a medical doctor, and another student was an emergency nurse, emergency room nurse. So I had those people around, though they were not there, and there's no way to communicate with anybody. And we have we have walking talkies because you know phones don't work in the woods. Um, so, but that that gets difficult because trying to find somebody for an emergency, like you know, for me it's usually a doctor or an ER nurse. Yeah, like that's, I need somebody to say like this even more serious. Should we send them out? Yeah. And then um, what about how you maintain your own calm and, you know, a level head in a stressful situation? Like at Rainbow Gatherings, there's a lot of people. So if somebody goes down from an injury or a heart attack or asthma attack, something stressful, there's usually a crowd of people around to talk about it and try to help. <laughs> how do you handle that? Like when you approach a situation with a bunch of people that are just adding to the problem? So first, I think there, I, you can't really divide all human beings into two groups, but I'm going to. <laughs> so one group of people, when everything goes wrong, they just, they lose it. They have a hard time. And then a large group of people, when things go wrong, that's when they step in because it helps them. Like it's, it focuses the energy. 
I'm one of those people, right? Yeah. As are so many others, especially in emergency medicine. Like, and I don't think, I don't really know if I'm a trauma junkie. Like I don't live for people to be hurt in a sense, yeah. but it is true when things go wrong, I tend to be able to focus pretty good in general. Mm-hmm. And so, so there's two questions you have. So the rainbow gathering has its own set of kind of rules and principles. Like, so when somebody's down, let's say they're having a seizure, right? Yeah. So somebody's having a seizure and there's like seven or eight people. Some of them are dangling crystals over them and some of them are saying stuff. But normally, right, somebody will be playing guitar and like singing them some lovely song. So really, I want to get rid of as much distraction as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you'll see right away is like, there'll be one or two people that you can see are skilled and also come. So you volunteer them, right? You say, can you be here for a little while? Can you help me get rid of these people? And so then we might say something like, you know, it's hard to work with so many people around if people can disperse a little bit. And hopefully people don't give you drop for it, which sometimes they do. If they have friends there, the friends will stay because right? you want you want to know what's going on anyway. And also it'd be, it's just cruel to ask friends to leave. Yeah, yeah. So, so then, so we clear the area. So that's so there's kind of that part. And the other part is, I, I mean, there are definitely things that ruffle me. If we talk politics, for instance, I will get easily ruffled. So, um, but in, in first aid situations, pretty good, unless it's really over my head. And then I just, I'll run and get somebody. Like there was somebody who was pregnant and started bleeding a few years ago, you know, uh, uterine bleeding. And okay. I like way out of my skill. I'm not, you know, cause you don't want to just stop the bleeding. But fortunately, I, you know, there's a place called Kitty Village, the Rainbow Gathering, and you can almost always find the midwife there. So that's exactly what I did. Mm. I Unfortunately, our walkie-talkies weren't working, so to physically run, find uh-huh. somebody, and bring them back, and then do that. Mm-hmm. Um, have them work with the person. Yeah. So you you generally just have a knack for staying calm and you know helping to bring calm to the situation. So that's good. I think so. Well, it's practiced, right? I mean, it, it's it's not innate. I mean, maybe some of it is innate. I, also, I mean, I run a I run a school with a bunch of unruly students like yourself. Like, I, have, I have other places where I have to practice keeping calm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it it is a, a, a crucial point that that when things are very intense, when uh you know it's like more on the life or death end of things, then it, you, you get focused mm-hmm. and and you can you can really just everything else just goes in the background. And you're just focused on what's important. What the what the emergency is, right? And the reality is, very few things are life and death at the Rainbow Gathering. So <laughs> people die, but generally they just die, right? It's not like a, a slow, torturous death because otherwise we're moving them to a hospital, right? So one year somebody died of an, an, an aortic aneurysm right at the first aid station. I mean, bam! But there was, I mean, but we got medical people there within seconds. It was amazing. Nurses, people, you know, uh, being able to give oxygen. Uh, giving up an effort, whatever they were doing was, I mean, way out of my skill set. I'm definitely standing back. At that point, I'm doing crowd control, right? Because we want to, we don't want this to spread around and just get a whole bunch of people because that'll just get weird. Because if somebody dies, so again, this is not like your average picnic, right? right. If somebody dies, the next step are police, right? Police have to come in and make sure it's not a homicide, right? So you want to just like keep the area free so that the medical people can talk about their experience about what happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You right. don't want to get like doing drugs right next to the <laughs> right you don't want somebody smoking and blowing smoke in a policeman's face no so if the rainbow gather so again so with the rainbow gathering in some ways the first aid area is more a safe place for law enforcement because we have to interact if things go wrong yeah the problem is many people do not want to interact with law enforcement right. yeah. and so that you know so we don't want we don't we don't want a presence at all we don't want a presence we right. want we want like the whole idea of everybody's medical is safety and that law enforcement don't bring the level of safety in general and there's not many other people who don't either mm-hmm. yeah. so let's talk about some of the things that you do treat a lot at the um first aid station you said before that foot injuries and um foot care i feel like i should do it to one of the biggest <laughs> if i could sing so i made a list <laughs> uh for <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this year mm-hmm. so every year foot injuries really i would say 65 percent like a super high number of foot injuries from people not wearing shoes like i would if i can like buy millions of shoes and pour some on people i would probably try to do that so people who tend to walk barefoot all the time 
tend to do good, right? Because they're you tend you can't. I mean, if you walk barefoot, you know, you get a sensitivity, like you know, you don't stop down hard. But lots of people get barefoot uh, for the first times in a long time in a gathering, and so it's just in and out, foot injuries, foot injuries, foot injuries, and they go staffy pretty regularly because your feet are in contact with the ground. And I don't really know why bacteria, but staph bacteria would be down there. Anyway, foot injuries are by far number one this year. COVID, what was it? The BA one. Uh, that's the one we had. So most people, it wasn't tremendously bad symptoms. Um, but of course, it also affected them, the first aid crowd, right? Mm -hmm. It was surprising because I learned firsthand or secondhand that COVID definitely spreads outdoors because we were like, you know, 9,000 feet in Colorado, 8,500 feet in Colorado, which is like outdoorsy as you can, you couldn't get more outdoorsy, right? right. Yeah. Uh, but people spread it. I'm not sure how. We never figured out the vector. We saw about 50 people. Um, fortunately, uh, this is a, so fortunately, I brought some tests, and some other people brought the test. And the local county, I think, dumped 500 tests with us, and we're like, we're never going to use these, right? Uh -huh. uh, because they expired in mid-July, like the brand that we were using. So I think they're like, we'll just give them to these people. Yeah. But in fact, we used we've I don't know 100 or 200 uh, COVID tests. We uh -huh. tested lots and lots of people over again. Um, yeah. to see who was positive. So anyway, COVID was a new one for us. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also the first year the Rainbow Gathering has been around in a bigger force since it, since the COVID happened in 2020. Uh, we also, like this is more for us this year, but also altitude sickness. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. 500. So, yeah. Uh, it's okay. not pretty bad ones. <laughs> it's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's also generally, I mean, we I rarely have seen anybody have really bad high altitudes of you know, sickness. Uh, usually they just feel terrible. And so they're yeah. just like curled up in a tent. That's um, uh, we, we, there was a couple of herbs we made. I actually made, a, put a couple of herbs together and gave it to the students to take to see if we can reduce, you know, because we're at, you know, we're 300 feet here in Ithaca. So um, it's hard to tell. So uh, we've given lots of herbs for the symptoms like headaches or trouble sleeping. And mm -hmm. then we gave a lot of people OSHA root, which I think works. It seems helpful. But it's, it, there's no immediate effect. Like, you don't know, give it OSHA to somebody who's having high altitude sickness. It's like, oh, my lethargy is gone. It takes a while. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would continue to do that. We also give four or five other herbs on a regular basis. But OSHA root, just having people chew it. Uh, we got a, I just had a bunch of roots with me. It actually grew there as well. Mm -hmm. awesome. uh, I don't harvest from the rainbow gathering. Right. Mm -hmm. um, lots of sprains and strains. They're up at the top. So people twisting their ankles and wrists. Uh, headaches are really common, headaches and high altitude sickness. A very common one is anxiety. And anxiety, so I've worked at a couple of places. Um, like I, I did Burning Man for a year. Um, I did, and I didn't work in the first aid station. I worked in like a, a wellness station. Um, here's why I'm saying it. I've also worked at other first aid events at like dance, at like EDM, electronic dance music festivals in Costa Rica for a little while. And one thing that's really persistent in all of them is anxiety. Yeah. Um, so I think like at Burning Man, it was interesting because people felt like they shouldn't be anxious because like the spirit of it. So I am not in the spirit of Burning Man. <laughs> if you would like, I, I wrote an extensive blog about it on my website. It's called, I went to Burning Man, so you don't have to go. <laughs> at seven. Uh, well, yeah, so lots of photos. big crowds are gonna, gonna make that happen for a lot of people. And like, the music. Yeah. Yeah. The intensity of all that interaction, the definitely. Blinky lights. Well, yeah, well, exactly all that gladiator cages. Right. Like, what happens is people think that they shouldn't be anxious. Oh. And that's what makes them even more. So like, they oh. feel like the outcast. Like I get to see lots of anxious people. At the Rainbow Gathering, same thing. Like like everybody thought about, you know, freedom and I don't know what they're talking about. Anyway, yeah, they're sitting around, <laughs> they're playing music, they're having a good time, but they're, they're anxiety because people can be anxious. And so... There's a sense of like, I don't want to be anxious because other people aren't. But what they don't know is many people there are, in all these places are anxious. Just many people are anxious. I mean, mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, anxiety is common. Uh, what do we got here? There's not that many. Digestive disorders. So digestive disorders means not getting the food you're used to and just having diarrhea, to having either viral or bacterial infections. Uh, this year, I don't think we had any. If we did, they were pretty minor. Um, as you mentioned, writing to BAC in Oregon, we had a pretty bad one uh, that people had a lot of vomiting and a lot of diarrhea, which becomes a medical emergency because you can't rehydrate, right? So if you just have diarrhea, very uncomfortable, no fun at all, 
but you can hydrate by drinking water. Yeah. When you have vomiting and diarrhea, because every time you have watery poop, right, all that water is coming out of your anus and you are losing water in your body. If you can't get it back in, you know, you have lower blood volume, your body's going to go into a whole hydration mode, which isn't healthy. And also you're losing electrolytes. So anyway, um, uh, so this year though, mostly just diarrhea, some people vomiting, uh, mm -hmm. but it didn't look like it, if it was infectious, it wasn't an infection that spread through the camp, which can happen. Oh yeah. Um, lots of staph infections, uh, less this year for some reason. Um, respiratory infections, not just COVID, but just run of the mill. Probably now they are now run of the mill, uh, flus and colds. And that's something we see a lot of, and I see a lot of at every place I work at, is asthma and allergies. So kicking up dust, being more active than you usually are. So those are some of the ones I think I see the most common. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, do you want to break down a little bit into more detail a couple of them? So maybe starting with wound care, because I think that's a really common thing, um, you know, with the foot injuries and, you know, staff. Uh, can you break down a little bit about what you do for wounds? Sure. So the easiest for wounds, your your real concern is infection, right? So, at, and if they're bleeding out. You know, and if they have like, if they have like a clotting disorder, most people though with clotting disorders know they have clotting disorders. And so they're, we're just going to bring them to a hospital. They're going to bring themselves really to a hospital. So, um, and then after that, you have people who are immune compromised from maybe anti-rejection drugs or whatever source uh, they are. And then, then you have like the concern that the infection not only will spread locally, but will get systemic. So it's really the first thing with a wound is evaluation. We've seen we see nasty wounds. I mean, I've seen people like with a hatchet, you know, cutting wood and then you know slamming it into their shin. Um, but a lot of them, frankly, we can fix. I can't. I don't know how to sew yet. That's like one of my life goals is learn how to sew people up. Um, I practiced once or twice at the gathering. There's a doctor who sometimes teaches us how to sew. Sew people. The, the technical word here is suturing. Um, but most, a lot of the times we can just use steri strips and other ways, really steri strips, yeah. uh, which are just basically sterile tape. Uh, but if it needs to be sewed, we get a doctor or, or a, a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of times it's really the doctor who's going to be more skilled in actually sewing people up. They're like cleaning uh, so, up and, and making sure there's no infection primarily. That, so yeah, initially it's evaluation, like what will happen if this goes bad, right? What what's the person's consequences of this? You know, if they have like if they, if you cut your thigh, the skin separates, and it's very hard to bring that back together. Right? You really you need to stitch. So again, something I don't do. Right. So then we clean it out. Um, we almost always give something for pain because it's going to be painful cleaning it out. Whether you know we're using a syringe or just cleaning it out with a sponge. Again, it's the same as first aid anywhere. The difference would be like. The pain killers or the pain helpers that I would use are herbal generally, you know, so there might be something like Skullcat or Valerian or a hops, mm -hmm. right? But we also have, you know, NSAIDs if they want, you know, ibuprofen or acetaminophen, which is not that great for that kind of pain initially, though. Mm -hmm. um, so then we clean it out um, and then we have to evaluate, can we just, you know, bandage this up, which is about, you know, 90% of the time uh, you can just, you know, clean it out. Uh, then we put herbs sometimes topically in the wound to, to reduce the chance of infection. Uh, herbs that would fit into there would be things like chaparral, lorea, or Oregon grapefruit, or echinacea. And so we'll put them in a liquid form, no powders. You don't want to powder in a wound because the wound can't heal. And maybe what we'll do is put on like a two by two, you know, a bandage, you know, cotton, cotton gauze, and soak it a bit in the tincture and then apply that and then put a vet wrap around that. And then usually we give the person some echinacea internally to just get their immune system a little more stimulated. I mean, lots of people heal pretty good from wounds. I mean, that's it. And because they're so common, people are very accepting of herbal medicine. Like other things that seem weird, people are like, I don't know if we can do this, but lots of people have treated their own wounds or things like bee stings that don't go anaphylactic. So they're, they're more open to herbs. Yeah. And then after you wrap it, how long do you recommend the person leave the wound wrapped up before you redress it? Uh, usually, so if they do it early in the morning, we might do it that evening. If they do it anytime later in the day, we have them come back the next day. 
We also let them know if the bandage, if bandages fall off all the time. I mean, they're outdoors, they might be dancing or just walking around, they might be carrying wood or cooking, they get sweaty and the bandage falls off. We're pretty good. I mean, I, I certainly have some, a lot of us have bandage wrapping skills. Um, to try to keep them in place. Some places are easier than others. We also have, we have, you know, like we use different kinds of tape. Like if somebody cuts themselves in the buttocks, usually what happens on the buttocks uh, is they'll get like a boil that opens up. And so then you, you can't wrap around the buttocks because then you can't do other, you know, services to your, you can't release things from your body. Sure. Um, but anyway, there's, there's, there's lots of new tapes that we tend to have around the, the tape. It's called Mediports, works great for holding it up there without sticking too much. Mm -hmm. So in other words, good equipment. Yeah, I love vet wrap. You introduced me to vet wrap, which is instead of being like sticky, like a tape that gets stuck in your skin, it just sort of holds itself together from like an elasticy type thing. And it's a game changer. I always have vet wrap around now for wound care. Same here. Yeah, it basically for people who don't know, vet wrap is like, if you've ever used ace bandages or sports wrap, if you made that much thinner and more elastic is what it is. So you, you just use it once and you throw it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then how do you distinguish a normal run-of-the-mill infection from a staph infection? Uh, pretty easy. So basically, if pus is coming out of a wound, you have staph infection, right? So staph is, is so the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is the commonness of staph. Yeah. So staph, it lives on, you know, there's different numbers, but like, you know, like 40% of us have staph as part of our colonies, usually in our armpits or in our nose. Um, but a lot of times you get a staph infection, you don't know, you just get pussy, you treat the pussy wound and you get better because your body, your immune system takes over. But sometimes the staph gets worse. And what'll happen is it'll, it'll it just the immune system is not fighting the st staph or bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus. And so the wound gets deeper and deeper. It rarely becomes systemic. Systemic staph is an absolute medical emergency, but pretty uncommon in these situations. Um, so what happens is the staph starts spreading. And so it'll spread to, you know, it'll, it'll spread to like where the hair follicles, because where hair comes out of the skin, you have a place where staph bacteria can colonize, especially if the person is shaved, right? Especially if you shave your legs, even using a good razor, you know, you just, you're leaving a place if you have staph for the staph to spread and get into these follicles, hair follicles. Mm -hmm. So um, I do have photos of staph wounds. We'd like to see some. Helpful. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And just a uh, warning to any squeamish people like Isaac. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Thank you. Uh, that you might see some nasty stuff right now. Yeah, I had staff two summers. Well, not last summer, but the summer before, and treated it with all these things, and it worked. It was pretty bad. You know, I thought it was a spider bite, right? <laughs> and then that's it. It's it's yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, let me spend a minute on that uh, before I go. So. Uh, Staff just really varies, and the person really varies. Sometimes I've seen bad staff, like meaning more aggressive staff on people, and have been able to treat it. And other times I've seen much lighter cases of staff that I haven't been able to treat. I, you know, I'm assuming it has something to do with the person's own immune competency, yeah, plus whatever factors come into these things. And the majority of people who get staff, or lots of them, think they have spider bites because. It all of a sudden shows up, right? So all of a sudden you have this place where pus is coming out, and you didn't feel anything happen there because you don't need a you don't need an obvious wound to get staff. Often people don't have obvious wounds and get staff. So like it came out of nowhere, and then there's a the whole idea like you know you know we swallow seven spiders every time we sleep, and the rest of them are crawling all over your body or something. So uh, neither is true. Spiders do not eat humans. So um, so but generally it's not a spider. Yeah, most spider bites heal on their own. There's a few. Anyway, that is, I do a whole, I do a whole dialogue on staff versus spider bites because actually I see, you can see the difference. All right. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna bring up some photos of staff. So if you're a squeam, squeamish, you might screamish. So you might want to uh, avoid uh, these your photos. Eyes. We'll okay. say we'll say when uh, later on in this, uh, AC and Isaac can say when. Um, like the timestamp or something. Safe to. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Safe to come back. Uh, let's see if we what happens here this time. So here's our shitter, which you don't need to see. Yeah. And here's. Yeah, now I can see. Yeah. Here's. Uh, <laughs> okay. Let's not start with that. No. Yeah. Not, uh, not. Yeah. All right. So, but, um, I. 
I say AC, I'm going to start here. It'll be a little less. We'll start people slowly and move them in. So this photo here is somebody who has staff. This person also had ringworm. It was pretty unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't really see the ringworm. But basically, that's a pretty bad case of staff. Uh, we gave them antibiotics. Again, I work with medical personnel, and we gave them antibiotics for this because what's clearly happening is it's spreading. I mean, it's over both of their legs, it's on their feet. You can see some in the inner thigh on one of their legs. Um, so this is just one example of staff. Uh, here's a different person, but the same idea. Basically, the staff is colonizing any small holes in their body and just making just making them deeper. So AC asked me previously, how do you tell the difference between a wound and a staph infection? And the answer is kind of a wound generally just heals, right? You get a wound and your body moves into a healing phase pretty quickly. And so you can see it getting better and better, even if it takes a while. With staph, it gets worse and worse, right? As the staph bacteria colonize the infection, as they colonize the wound, um, they deepen it and make it worse looking. And also you'll see pus start to come out of it if you squeeze around it. So this person, by the way, is soaking their feet in chaparral tea, uh, but we give them antibiotics, but they have, they have a pretty bad case of staph uh, there. So it's gonna get a little bit worse from here. So with staph, often you have to release it. So you need a scalpel or something to open it up because what'll happen is as the bacteria are beneath the skin and they start, the white blood cells will start to fight it and that's gonna cause inflammation and pressure. And so there's pus underneath the skin and it's really painful. So what you have to get good at is you have to lance it and, and drain it. And there's a number of ways of doing that. It's a whole course in itself. The black around this sub, that's just activated charcoal. We give activated charcoal as a primary herb here um, to help with it. So that's not it. Uh, this next one, uh, let's see what it is. Uh, this is an early stage. So this is a staph wound that needs to be uh, lanced. So basically, it's really painful for this person. There was a hole in the middle, but now it's closed up. Uh, it's probably too early to lance it right then. It wouldn't really, it, would, it wouldn't drain very well, but it's probably going to build up a lot of pressure. Um, and you can see like they have a cut on top over there in the leg. But it also, like, I'd have to look at the whole person and think, you know, do they have other ones or is just one isolated case of staph infection? And then our last one is, it's really very gory, and or, or second to last, but this one. So these are just some much worse cases of staph. Uh, the bottom right is how, that's the vet wrap and tape holding the vet wrap in place. Vet wrap is self-adhesive, the purple stuff, but not self-adhesive enough. Um, and so, you know, on the upper left, uh, that's some actually new scar, that, that omelet looking yellow, that's actually positive uh, tissue coming in, granulation tissue. Now, that's not the infection. Above it, uh, you can see new pustules or new infections opening up on that person on the upper left with, on the leg. Um, on the right is just draining, right? That's just what you'll see in a lot of cleaning up. Again, anything black in here, I've got lower left and upper right, but that's just activated charcoal. Uh, active, Staff does not make um, uh, that's not called blackening of the skin. So, and then uh, the bottom right, the uh, bottom left, excuse me, uh, that was a really staff deep staff infection. The person in the bottom left is the same person who's on the bottom right. And actually, we worked with uh, them for a while and and worked out it better. Um, you can see though, if you look in the bottom left. There's another one just opening up right above it. So that was a big concern. There's a small little red mark on the upper right to the big hole in the middle of the picture. Um, but it took a while. You can, I mean, there's a lot of tissue in there. There's definitely tissue damage. Uh, I knew this person. That makes a difference. So together, we can evaluate how much care they needed. Um, and probably antibiotics. This was a long time ago. And probably antibiotics might have been helpful. But actually, it cleared it up with just herbs. And that, my friends, is my staff photos. Uh, over the years, I've had a lot of experience with staff infections. One of the main things is, is the person willing to do the work with herbs? Like if you if you wanted to take antibiotics, that is your right. You can go, we might have them, or we might not have them at the first aid station, or they can go to a clinic and get antibiotics. I don't tell people not to. Um, then you have antibiotic resistant staff too. So then you have things like MRSA, right, or VERSA, you know, methicillin-resistant staph infections. 
Uh, you can't really tell, though, if they have MRSA or not unless they come in and know it. Because you can have a bad or a not so bad case of staph. That doesn't determine what's MRSA, which is, um, which is one type of antibiotic resistance. Um, so, right, they might have antibiotic uh, resistance as well. If they've had multiple staph infections, which many people have, uh, then you start to really start to see the development of it, mm -hmm. the antibiotic resistance. But here's what I wanted to also say is if the person seems like they don't really want to do much and they're just going to do like the least amount possible, they have a contagious infection. So they shouldn't be touching other people. They should be taking, washing themselves, taking herbs because we use herbs regularly for that. So one of our evaluations, antibiotics and non-antibiotics is like, how determined is this person? How competent are they to take care of themselves with that, with using herbs? Because with herbs, you need to do it every day. With right. antibiotics, you do too, but it's just a pill. Yeah. Might be pill today with a bad case. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you have to like unwrap it, change everything, change the... Yeah, the you, have to, you have to clean it out. You have to drain it and clean it out. Yeah usually once a day depends i mean some staph infections are very minor and you really just have to you yeah. just have to wash the area bandage it and put some herbs on there give them some herbs internally but yeah it is hard if it's a stem if it's like all over their body and then they're sleeping in the same sleeping bag every night you can't really wash your sleeping bag like exactly. around yeah and so one of, the, one of the reasons it's common at the rainbow gathering is a lack of hygiene and it's not really it's not even talking about the people it's just like where are you going to wash right there's no right. You know, bathtub or a shower you don't have a sink right yeah. And like, you don't want to wash your staff in an open stream, right? right either. So, uh, but we have, we have lots of wash basins and work with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so the herbs that you use would kind of be the same ones just for any infection, like the um, chaparral. chaparral, that's what we used in actually charcoal for, yeah, echinacea. Yeah, so we do it both internally and externally. There's a couple of herbs, it's really just categories, right? So like in, in the category of, Externally, what like more strong antibacterial, which could be something like myrrh or echinacea or Oregon grapefruit. Uh, then you want an astringent to help the wound heal, and that could be something like oak bark or witch hazel. Um, and then you want a vulnerary, something that helps the tissue mend itself, and that might be something like chamomile or even yarrow. Mm -hmm. So there's there's lots of herbs you can use uh, externally. Sometimes we alternate them with activated charcoal poultices. Just depends on what's going on with the wound. The problem with activated charcoal is you're putting a powder in a wound, and then the wound has a harder time healing because you have physical material in there that has to be expunged. But and so, what what is the point of of using the activated charcoal? It soaks up the. It the, draws. Yeah. yeah. So the herbal stuff kills stuff and helps the skin mend. Uh, the activated charcoal is able to pull up some bacteria and some bacterial endotoxins that get released by the bacteria. I, at this point, I use the herbs more. I like it's just it's just much less messy to put make yeah. a couple of tinctures and put them herbs on there and, and wrap them in place. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, the activated yeah. charcoal does get over on everything. <laughs> yeah. It's messy stuff. Yeah, yeah, very messy. Yeah, but it is it is great. Yeah, it's very useful stuff too. Thank you for that really in depth deep dive into wound care and staff. I feel like that's something that's really common and super useful for anyone listening to this. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit more about um, other of the common ailments like stress and anxiety and herbs that you use real quick or digestive distress? Uh, we, could, we could do anxiety herbs. So kind of with herbs for anxiety, you have two partitions in there. You have herbs that help with anxiety that are sedative. In other words, that it might like impair the person's ability to function and at the same high rate. And then you have herbs uh, for people that want the nervous system to work better, but don't want to kind of be brought down. They don't want the set of out. So that's from the first questions. Like if I give you this, it makes you a little more tired or a little less cognitive, cognitively functional or you know less focused. Is that something you want? Some people with anxiety want that. They just want, they just want to chill out. And other people want to continue doing what they're doing. Let's say they're working in a kitchen and they want to have, make sure they're, you know, they're up to par. So in the sedative range of herbs, the things that also you might take to help you fall asleep, you would have things like kava kava, uh, valerian, and hops. And those are probably the three strongest herbs that, are, that we use uh, to help people like just mellow them out, to use an expression from my youth. And then we have the 
the other herbs, and then you have just a bunch of them. And kind of the disposition of the person is partly at play. Like if they have a very overactive mind, things like blue vervain or uh, passion flower could be very helpful. Um, they have a lot of tautness in their body, something like skull cap, which can sometimes be a little sedative for people and other times not, uh, can be really helpful. Um, more sedative in the tea form than the tincture form for me. Yeah, you know, we hardly use any teas at the gathering. They just take too much time. And right. then we have to wash everything. Yeah. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. But sometimes people will bring hot water. I mean, a lot of people come from like a main kitchen, you know, one of the kitchen serving. And so they have plenty of access. So, you know, if they come with hot water, uh, and we have, you know, we have a way to make hot water. We can do it. It's just tinctures are easy. The problem with tinctures, though, is they're in alcohol. And we ask every single person that we give tinctures to if it's acceptable, because many people like everywhere else, um, alcohol is not something they ever want in their body. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, and so we use a lot of wood betony, motherwort, um, lemon balm, uh, so many. Damiana, those are some of the ones we use. Rose, Tulsi. Yeah. Every time I say those are the ones, I'll have a few more. But we use them all pretty regularly. I do make some uh, combinations and bring them in as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, those will. So th this leads me to something a little bit different. So when people come in for first aid, they don't just need one dose of something. It's uncommon. Maybe like they, if they have a bad headache, you can give them some aspirin or some herbs that might help. But general anxiety, it's not like you come in, you take some herbs and your anxiety is better and you leave. Mm -hmm. Your anxiety might be a little bit better. Uh, but then we also have one ounce to go bottles and then we'll, you know, put some proportion of tincture in there and then fill the rest up with water. And so they can take it throughout the day. Also, if you have anxiety, it's like a it's like a, a huggy blanket or something, like having a medicine that you can take uh, yeah. when you're anxious. It just it feels quite good. And the medicines are nice. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you do that for people. They're like these little plastic bottles with a screw yeah. top. You just take a sip. And I've actually done the math, like how much a capsule equals a dropper full and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it is like a little hug in a bottle for folks. I agree. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, all of those herbs um, are good to have on hand in every home and first aid kit, I would say. All those I would agree. stress relieving herbs because it's just stressful times these days. <laughs> you know, I think it's always been stressful times. I think human beings are a stressful creature <laughs> and we just we have we will learn to stress ourselves in every situation. So we have to have all these like you know, meditative practices because it's because we have to undo this winding up thing. I mean, I might be projecting a little bit here, <laughs> but I see a lot of people in the free clinic as well. Anxiety is a uh, main reason, but people also like to see herbalists for anxiety because if, if they don't want to take medications, so I'm pro medication, mm -hmm. but if they don't want to take medications, uh, they can definitely start with herbs and see if they help with their anxiety. This brings up another question about medication and mental health, like, um, do you have any advice for, for folks that might be working a first aid situation and somebody's having a clear acute mental health crisis? That's a, so it's a really long conversation. So we see two of those. Uh, we will see people who are bipolar or just manic. We don't usually see the depressive side of bipolar. We see the manic side of bipolar. Mm -hmm. And then people could be harming themselves and harming other people during this phase. And if nothing else, they're just really pissing a lot of people off, depending on how their where their mania takes them. And then occasionally we'll see people having a schizophrenic or a paranoid schizophrenic episode as well. Um, often they've stopped their medications. Mm. And so we can try to help them, but our goal is basically to know if they have medications, if we can get them back on their medications uh, for that. I think you have to, you know, it's they're difficult, right? Mm. You know, you're not dealing with coherency uh, when or people in these situations. And so you have to really understand that it is a sickness, right? That something is going wrong in them and it's, they're not trying to taunt you though they taunt, like some of the often in manic episodes, particularly, they would be very taunting and sometimes very cutting, right? To, to everybody around them, it's just the amazing stream of invectives coming out of them. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think again, it's kind of being to have a calm, and having patience with the person, um, trying to figure out the best situation for them. Like, do they have friends? But really, a lot of times, frankly, it's like 
Do they have medications? Where can we get their medications? Because the thing we can't do, and so that's the problem. That with most anxiety, right? People can still function. They can get themselves out of the woods and back to where they want to go to. In these more extreme mental health issues, they cannot. Like their functionality is much lower. And so you can't just like leave a gathering and leave people who are having mental health crisis there. So we have to bring them someplace or get them someplace. Um, so it's a, I think I, I don't want to go into the details. I do talk about it regularly. They're very unpleasant often, uh, what, what we do. But the goal is like if they're on medication to get them back on their medication and, or to find a resource for them, a family member or a friend uh, to help get them to a safer place. Because often they're not going to come down the amount of days that we're there. Uh, so, right. so yeah. do you sometimes like try to help a little bit by giving some gentle chamomile or anything like that, or you know, in the meantime while you're looking for friends and family or getting them somewhere safe? We can try that. So, if people are more are more in a paranoid state, they're they are less likely to take anything given by healthcare workers who they're seeing as a threat at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um. But if not, we can. I, I'm pretty careful about cannabis, marijuana, but an old slang. Like a couple of years ago, we had somebody in a very manic phase and he just wanted to smoke. And I'm like, it's not a good idea. And finally, somebody gave him a joint and he smoked and just got way worse. Oh, no. So I'm sure that's not always the case, but I see it enough that I, I you know, I think people want to do good and, you know, to just help, help this person. But actually, he became less coherent and harder for us to work with. Mm, Over yeah. time, he actually got more coherent. And we were able to get him, once again, his medication. Mm -hmm. And then we helped get him to a place to get him to safety. Like mm -hmm. not being able to get the Rainbow Gathering is not a good place to be in these states. They're not, it's um, highly triggering. It's triggering is the word. And people espouse weird things like you don't need to take medications, right? When some people definitely do need, at least at that point in their life, do need to take medications, right? So they're like, so. but that's, just, that's a small group of people. Yeah. yeah, well, um, we're coming to the top of our hour seven song and yeah. gone into this, some great detail and and almost didn't mention herbs whatsoever. <laughs> it, seems, <laughs> it seems really typical of me these days. I think I'm I'm much I'm often I think more interested in like the detail around working rather than because the herbs I think are easier to find. Yeah, but maybe we talk about it. maybe sometime in the future I'll actually talk about herbal medicine and plants. Yeah, we, we covered some of the herbs for, yeah. you know, different things, but um, yeah, you're right. This one was really giving us a picture of what like working first aid is all about and what it looks like, you know, so. Yeah, so I'd like, so if people are interested, it's really like, I think what AC asked is just really important. Like you, if you're going to do this, like you have to center yourself, right? You, you have to realize that you're putting yourself in the unhealthiest place of an event generally, right? I mean, you're going, basically you're saying, I wanna be around sick people. That is my goal going to this wonderful outdoorsy event. Yeah. Um, and so you wanna make sure that your health is reasonably good in whatever way that's necessary for you. You wanna make sure that people get proper rest um, you know, or just take breaks. It's really easy to get drawn in every, I mean, this is the thing I have to do. I have to grab the students and pull them out because you get a feeling of self-importance. Like I have to be here for when this person comes back, but your skills are going downhill as you're not taking your own uh, time away. Yeah. Uh, and then really just, you know, just learning how to like, I guess, understand that there's a lot of sickness around and many people who can be very annoying, that's what they're exhibiting and mm -hmm. trying to practice patience. But thank you, Isaac, and thank you, AC, for once again having me on here. Yeah, yeah. great advice, Seven Song. Is there anything else that you want to uh, say before we leave? Like, um, are you excited about any new things? Working on a database? Are you going to be yes. teaching again soon? <laughs> um, I'm trying to avoid saying political things. Oh. Um, I, I am taking the year off. So I run an herb school in Ithaca, New York, the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine, which I think is like in its 28th year, which is crazy. Look at these great hairs. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'm taking next year off. I'm probably going to travel and do some teaching. Uh, the only thing I know I really want to do is go to the Black Hills, that region of the Dakotas, because I just want to see the plants. I'm a botanist. I, I've never been to that region and explored the plants. Many of them are endemic or just to that region. They're not a gathering trip. This is just a viewing trip. 
Yeah. It's something just I've been working on a database uh, that is going to be free and online, and it'll be an ongoing project probably for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. which I'm hoping is many, many years to come. Oh, yeah. um, but that'll be off my website in a little while. And so it'll be a searchable database with lots of photos and stuff like that. But I, I go between excitement and like wondering why I started this with that one. No, it's really cool. I'm really glad that you yeah. started it. It's very it's awesome. helpful. So it's a database of uh, herbs and ailments and sort of your like major go-to bullet points of like what you do for those ailments, which is so helpful. So Thanks. Thanks, I'm really grateful you're doing that. Yeah. Thank you again for being on the show. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And everybody can check out your website at seven song, the number seven S O N G dot com. Correct. All right. Bye. Seven nice song. To see you both. Bye. Bye.